Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at CrossFit Auto Body, located in Union City. CrossFit Auto Body is the perfect place to begin your fitness journey. Come in and become part of the CrossFit community. Visit uccrossfitautobody.com for more information. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Emily Workman shares with Scott what life is like as a farmer and why she's glad she and her husband are raising their children on the farm. Also, they discuss why providing food and fiber for the rest of the world is increasingly important. Hello, I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little section of the South as we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee. I'm so excited about today's guests and our topic. There's a famous quote that every day, at least three times a day, you need a farmer. And I have a real honest-to-goodness farmer here today, Emily Workman. Welcome, Emily. Hey, good to see you. Um, Emily has a Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture from UT Martin, and in addition to farming the same land as her grandfather, she is employed as a precision ag specialist for Greenway Equipment. She and her husband, Clint, who we'll hear a little bit more about, have won all sorts of awards and accolades, way too many to go into now. So before we talk about um, what got you here and, and the path you took, Emily, let's talk a little bit about what you and Clint are doing now. So tell me about you know your farming and your, your business and all the things that you guys are doing. Okay, yeah. So um, I was raised on a row crop farm. Um, I spent my whole life doing 4-H and FFA and I just loved the farm from, I guess, the first day my parents brought me home from the hospital. So for people who don't know, what exactly is a row crop farm? So row crops would be anything when you're driving down the road and you see it planted in rows, um, corn, wheat, soybeans, um, cotton, uh, anything pretty much in Obine County that you see is going to be a row crop. And then like whenever you think of sweet potatoes or any kind of vegetables, that would be a specialty crop. Okay. Um, And then you have the livestock industry and there's probably several more that I'm leaving out. Okay. And so, so, so we're going to talk a whole lot more about your childhood because I'm fascinated what got you here. Um, but now you guys have a huge, you and your husband, Clint, and you have children and y'all have a huge um, operation you're running. Tell us about that. Um, well, it makes me laugh that you say huge because like, you probably thought it sounded huge. We're actually pretty small farmers um, for this area, but we farm 1,600 acres of row crop. So we just grow corn and beans. We used to grow wheat and uh, got out of that because the market just kind of fell out um, for it to be profitable. Um, And then in 2012, uh, my husband and I decided to put in um, some hog barns to kind of diversify and and just um, move risk around, just spread the risk out. Um, So we have about 5,000 head of hogs, um, and and we turn that over twice a year. So we run about 10,000 hogs through there every year. Um, And so... uh when you talk about things like diversify and, and, you know, you guys are definitely business folk. In addition to being farmers, a lot of people possibly have a stereotype of a farmer as being a certain way. And so, you know, I know I, you came to visit here not too long ago and I had told the person at the front, you know, we have uh, uh, some farmers who are coming in to meet with us, you know, and afterwards she said, wow, you said farmers and I wasn't expecting, you know, who came. So um, I think that's something we're going to talk about in a little bit too, all the different things that go into running you all's business. Now, in addition to your farm, you also work for another company. What's that about? So I work for a John Deere dealership that's based out of Arkansas. Um, So, I mean, as a dealership, our primary focus is selling hard iron equipment, but we have a department, which is what I work in. Um, It's our precision ag department. So all the technology that they're putting on the equipment these days with computers and GPS, we basically have to have a whole department to kind of support that 
Um, and then we are selling crop services on top of that and buy crop services. I mean, basically just trying to help our farmers manage their data that they're recording through the field and make decisions based off of the data, um, whether it be what variety of corn do they want to, you know, buy for next year because it did really well this year, or what variety they want to avoid buying. Um, maybe they want to plant a seed prescription through the field to cut costs in areas that are going to be low produ- producing anyway, or maybe they add a little higher rate under a center pivot, which is irrigation for those who don't know what a center pivot is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're also doing things like record keeping and profitability um, just to track those things on the farm. So um, it makes me laugh. Yeah, we have to be business people and, and the um, stereotype exists probably for a reason for, for every group of people that have a stereotype. There's someone who probably carried that. Um, but nowadays, if, if you're not a businessman, you're, you're not going to watch the next generation take your farm over. Um, we've watched, I can't tell you, and I, and I don't mean that, that people that aren't making it aren't doing the right things, but it's a risk every year. You, you don't know if you're going to make money or not. And so, um, you have to do every little thing you can to try to watch that. And, you know, we always say our goal is, is to break even really. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we'd like to make money, but if you can break even, you're doing okay. And so to talk a little bit about your life as a, as a farmer, um, why don't you uh, share uh, a description because we can't look right now, but on Facebook, what were some of the pictures that you posted when you did, was it nine? I think it was 10. I always just do my own thing. I think it was supposed to be 10 and I don't remember if I actually did 10 or not. Yeah, what were some of the photos? Because I loved every single photo. It was was a fascinating look inside the world of a farmer. And that's encouraging because, man, I got tired of posting those things (laughs) and I felt like it was the same thing every day. But um, I guess a few of the topics I hit, and you can remind me if I forget some. Um, I shared my granddad, uh, 91 years old. We put him on a combine uh, using the forklift at the shop. And I, I loved the whole idea of the family, you know, the grandfather wanting to be on the combine one more time and you all using a forklift to get him up there so he could actually experience that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you farm, you love it. And so that, I mean, he's at nine, he's 92 today, but he still loves it. And uh, What's his name? Billy, Billy Clark. Happy birthday, Billy Clark. Yeah, today's his birthday. Happy birthday, granddaddy. But so I shared him just because it is, it's a family thing. It's a passion that you have. Um, so... On the opposite end of the spectrum, I shared my kids helping us. They're three and five. And obviously, selfishly, we would like to watch them take the farm over one day. But uh, we, if the Lord leads them in a different direction, then, you know, we're going to support that too. Um, but I do just enjoy having them being raised on the farm the same way I was, the experiences that um, other kids don't get to have. And you brought up earlier, um, you know, in this small town, even to me, I'm used to it and it's normal. And I didn't realize how abnormal my, my growing up was. Mm-hmm. Um, some other things I shared was my husband getting hurt. Uh, cause that's a reality. Um, in eight years of marriage, actually, I'm going to say in seven years of marriage was when that happened. We had already been to the ER three times and had a helicopter ride. Um, yeah. What was that about? So he, we had an auger get stopped up on the grain bins, and so he was having to manually put his hands on a pulley and, and rotate it backwards to try to unclog it, just get, it had too much corn clogged up in there. Um, and my dad got a little excited, I guess, and flipped the switch before Clint got his hands off of it. Um, so his thumb went up around, you know, underneath the belt, yeah. in between the belt and the pulley, and it pretty much cut his the tip of his thumb off oh my god it was still dangling oh my gosh. um so but, farming is i think a lot of people probably don't realize how dangerous it really is and how many get hurt yeah which i kind of make fun of clint i tell him he's an accident waiting to happen mm-hmm. um i don't know that everyone has experienced the same emergency calls that we have yeah. um but yeah you see a lot of farmers missing their ring finger where something got a hold of their ring and uh they, lo- they lost their finger. You see some missing arms or, um, I mean, it can be very it's dangerous. It's dangerous work. Yeah. So what were some of the other photos? 
I love the photos of you holding the little baby, your little oh, baby. Oh yeah, you know when 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 it was a newborn. Yeah, and you're having to keep going. You know, you're so, out in the field. Yeah, motherhood. Um, Clint and I always talk about maybe it wasn't the best idea that we both went into agriculture with um, being a married couple and trying to raise a family because we were both busy at the same time. And and the deal with being an agriculture mother is. Um, at that time, I still worked for Greenway, but I'm, I'm over here by myself. Um, I had my crop services customers and I didn't have anybody but me that could manage that and handle that. So I gave birth to both of my kids and loaded them up in the truck at 14 days old and went to set combines or, um, you know, do yield calibrations, whatever it was. Um, if it was, where I just absolutely couldn't take them with me. My mom is retired, so I could leave them with her. Um, but I was breastfeeding, so it was easier to just take them when I could. And so I, I put my little sling on, and I climbed up and down cotton pickers and combines. And um, both of my kids were born, like, August 29th and August 31st. Oh, so wow. Right, right before harvest. Yeah. So, And my boss is very – he's a good boss. Um, he let me – um, you know, he knew I was taking my kids to work and sure. I didn't get six months or six weeks of maternity leave, yeah. but, um, you know, he lets me, he let me get my time when I needed it. And what uh, a great way on. for them to grow up. Yeah. Um, are those the kind of moments when you are really, when you really celebrate the life you chose, the, the farming life, are there other kind of moments like that where you just really are grateful for, uh, the, the farming life? Yeah. I mean, I love it because my kids are learning, you know, the facts and the truths of agriculture rather than what Facebook tells them or what the internet tells them or what their friends tell them. Um, and they can, you know, tell some adults how pieces of equipment operate that, you know, at five years old. Um, I remember one of my good friends, he farms and his his six-year-old was telling me how many hydraulic cylinder, cylinders there were on this track hoe and mm-hmm. what they did. And I was like, wow, he already knows all this at seven or six, however old he was at the time. Um, so I do. I love it. And my dad said I was born also in August, and allegedly I rode um, back back then. The combines had a toolbox behind the seat, so they just took everything out of it and laid blankets in it. And I guess I laid back there behind my dad when my mom had to go back to work. Wow, that's so, amazing. I mean, I do realize that that's unique and cool. So. Yeah. Um, do you, was there a moment, at, at what point did you decide that you wanted to follow in your family's footsteps as a farmer? Was there a specific moment or was it an evolution? Um, I mean, I always loved agriculture. Um, like I said, I was raised on the farm, and, and I think it is just a passion that – that you have, um, cause my sister was raised the same way as me and she now lives in Salt Lake city and is a doctor, mm-hmm. you know, and she appreciates her time on the farm, but yeah. I always wanted to be out there helping my dad always. And, you know, she was more into, you know, girly things and going out with her friends and, um, doing her thing. So I always loved it. And like I said, I did 4-H and FFA, um, and those, those organizations, I mean, they, I kind of, you know, being raised on the farm, I, I guess I probably knew about farming, but they actually helped me become the communicator that I am today. Um, they have, you know, public speaking contests and um, judging contests where you have to give, you know, oral reasons for why, why did you choose to place this animal first in the class and this one last. Um, so I actually went to college to become an ag education teacher and then when I student taught, I decided that wasn't for me. But I knew that I wanted to do some some form of agriculture. Um, so I actually went to work for the co-op system to start out with. Um, had no idea I was going to do precision ag. Didn't really know anything about it. Um, and I got handed a computer and a couple phone numbers to help me. And, you know, here you go. We hope you can figure it out because... It was I was the I was the precision ag department basically. They were just opening one. They didn't have one. Um so I took soil samples, um, and we call it grid samples, which is for variable rate fertilizer, mm-hmm. another thing that farmers can do to um optimize production and um minimal minimalize, you know, fertilizer runoff into our waters and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um 
But then I worked there for three and a half years and Greenway hired me and trained me really well. And I don't know, I've loved it. I, I couldn't have picked a better job. You know, I had no idea what I was doing, but I've, I've loved it. So you mentioned Precision Ag, and in doing a little bit of research, I see Precision Ag all over the place. Can you, uh, what, what, what is that? So um, it's grouped basically into a large, I guess I, I call it a department because that's what we're in, but um, all the technology that we use these days, um, it's for efficiency and to um for sustainability um so we all all the tractors and combine sprayers um they have computer systems in them and they have gps's to track their locations uh and we are recording everything that they do so speed um if they're planting a certain variety of corn what variety are they planting what rate are they planting um we do the prescriptions, like I told you, you know, um, an easy one is inside and outside of a center pivot, which is the irrigation system. You'll lower the rate outside of the pivot because it's basically saying, I bet it doesn't rain. Mm. There, I'm not going to plant as much seed out here. Um, and then we're using all the data, so like from the combines, um, yield data, um, and then, you know, moisture. Uh, and then from sprayers, we're putting whatever crop protection we're putting down. We're keeping up with all those rates. Um, and we're taking all this information and overlaying it and just looking at how did this affect this, you know, affect this and just go down the line. And we're trying to make better decisions. Um, we're trying to use less resources, you know, get more done with less, basically, um, more done with less is probably the best um, description I can think of. So in past years, to apply certain things like fertilizers or whatever, to, they would just fly airplanes over and just, do they still do that? Or now does the new equipment replace that kind so, of thing? Um, so they, they, we've, we've used airplanes, but generally for fertilizer, you use a spreader truck. And they've always done that. Um, but now the spreader trucks have... Uh, controllers on them where they can put out variable rates of fertilizer. So um, like we'll take, I call it grid sampling. So every two and a half acres or every five acres, you'll take a soil sample. Whereas 30 years ago, you might pull into a hundred acre field and take one soil sample for the whole field. And um, they would do a blanket rate of lime. Uh, we have, you know, you have to get the pH right with the soil. Um, so they would do like two tons to the acre of lime to try to raise the pH a little. Um, and then with the fertilizer, uh, 300 pounds of 92330, which is a fertilizer analysis, that would be kind of, or maybe 400 pounds, depending on your crop, uh, that would be kind of par. Everybody just kind of did the same thing. So we started taking these grid samples and learned you know, maybe you do need that much. Maybe you need more in this little area, but over here you can cut back 50%. So especially with the lime to bring the pH up, we found that farmers are just, it's an instant, save. you're saving money. The grid sampling costs a little more because you're sending, you know, 50 soil samples for a field instead of one. Um, so the the lab has to, you know, run an analysis on all that and send information back. But just based on the inputs, you know, on lime, you're saving money for sure. I never guarantee people you're going to save money on fertilizer because um, you may be putting more here where you're saving. You know, you're saving money over here, but you may be spending more over there. Um, and so, and we do still use planes. I don't know that planes are putting out variable rate fertilizer, but that's usually just to get over corn that's too tall to run equipment over. Um, and then we put fungicide on beans, which is just a disease preventative. Um, we'll do that with planes a lot. Well, what, what, um, obviously the whole topic of food and food production is a huge issue today, loaded with books and documentaries and, um, there's organic this and, and I've seen things labeled organic that aren't even organic. So, um, I've also seen the stats that by 2050, we won't have enough food to feed. The, we don't have enough food to feed the world now, but we'll have even less, especially here in the U.S. You know, with the global population going to be 9 billion, they're saying there will be a severe lack of food. So I know that you're knee deep in that whole world. What are your some of, some of your thoughts on, on those kind of things? So, I mean, that's kind of where we're going with all the um, 
precision ag with all the GMOs that everyone hears about and they're terrified of. Um, and just for anybody who doesn't know what a GMO is, can you break that oh, down for oh, us? Yeah. So GMO means genetically modified organism. Um, I've actually found that most people don't even know what it stands for. They just associate it with bad. Um, GMOs are not bad. They are going to feed the world when we get to a population of 9 billion. Um, that's how we're trying to accomplish that. Um, there have been so many studies. Um, everyone tries to point to GMOs for, you know, everything bad. You know, it's causing cancer. It's causing um, the gluten allergies. It's causing, you know, um, that's not true. Everything has been debunked. Um, and basically, I mean, Genetically modified organism, I guess the simplest way to put it is we're just, we're speeding up. Organisms are going to modify themselves genetically just through time and, and just, you know, the evolution of, you know, it's got to adapt to survive. We're speeding that up a little. Um, so bite tolerant is a, is a genetic modification. So corn um, used to be plagued by, you know, insects, and, and it still is, but... Um, we have, it's called the BT gene, and um, I, I think it came from kelp. I can't remember where all the science came from, but basically it makes the corn plant just um, harder to bore into and also just not as delicious, I guess, to the bugs. You know, they're just kind of, it's easier just to go to the woods, if you know, and stay out of the cornfield, which, I mean, that that keeps us from having to spray as much insecticide if our plants have built-in armor. Um, and so another genetic modification is is golden rice, um, and that's actually being grown. Um, that's through Syngenta. Um, they've made some promises with some countries that I cannot remember what countries they were, but they've got a lot of vitamin A deficiency. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this golden rice is like power packed with vitamin A and they basically just took a gene from another plant that, that makes it produce lots of vitamin A, um, and, and put it into these rice plants. And, um, so now I I thought it would just be better nutrition, but what I read about it, it's, it's saving lives. So, um, and then all the genetic modifications are, are to produce better yields. So just produce more food. Because, I mean, every time a Walmart goes up, every time, you know, any any store, I don't want to call Walmart out. If you build a house, anything, you know, a lot of times we're taking up farmland and, and they're not making any more of that from what I hear. And if people if people don't understand the importance of what you do, the World Economic Forum just put out a study on food and found that nearly 80 percent of the world's poor live in rural areas and work in agriculture. Um Malnutrition, even though they're working in agriculture, malnutrition is the largest contributor to disease in the world. Over 4 billion people are um, either micronutrient deficient or, or overweight. So, um, you know, there's a lot of food ailments going on in spite of the fact that we have all this technology. In the U.S., 42.2 million people today live in food insecure households, meaning they don't have the right kinds of foods or enough foods, and that includes 13.1 million children. So, you know, the work that you're doing to try to feed, you know, the world's children and the children in the U.S. is is crucial, yeah. especially as the population grows. Yeah, and genetic, uh, genetically modified organisms too. I mean, that makes food affordable. So. Um, you know, when you're able to produce more with less, obviously it's going to be more affordable. Um, and you were, you know, you talked about organic, um, you brought that up earlier, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so farmer, you know, I, I, if there was another farmer in here that grew totally organic, everything and grass fed beef and everything, you know, we would have no problems with each other. If there's a market for it and, and you're making money at that, and that's how you're able to keep your farm surviving, go for it. But I do want the public to know that um, organic doesn't necessarily mean healthy or good for you. They still put pesticides on those. And then those pesticides are not regulated by the USDA um, in any way. Um, So you're much more likely to risk um, some sort of illness or taking in some sort of product that's bad for you when you're buying organic because um, they're they're not regulated. 
Um, and you can almost slap an organic label on anything. Um, it doesn't matter what, what you've done to it. Um, and so when I'm in the grocery store, I mean, I, I honestly, you know, um, we grow, we grow GMO corn and beans and, uh, I believe in it and, um, you know, feeding the food to my kids. I, I'm not going to do anything to my kids that I think it's bad. So I, I don't like the fear marketing that they're doing, um, saying that this chicken is hormone free. There is no chicken in the grocery store that has hormones in it. There's no chicken there. So hormone-free is a deceptive label to get you to spend more money to buy their chicken because the chicken sitting right beside it that doesn't have that label is also hormone-free. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, and then I, if I see that it says organic or all-natural, what does all-natural mean? Nobody knows. You can slap that on anything. Yeah. Um, I, I put it back. Um, if it's got the Butterfly, the non-GMO project on it, yeah. I put it back. That's a way for them to... Have you spend more money because you think that you're buying healthy? Um, I've been guilty of that before, so I'm glad yeah, to know this. Yeah. What so, about cage free eggs and paying like twice as much? Are those chickens, you know, really living in little houses? And, and or, so, I mean, I'm definitely not a chicken farmer, and yeah. I. Um, well, how about hogs? Are there are there people raising hogs in different ways, or are all yep. hogs raised the same yep. way, or what's What's hog farming all about? So um, with hog farming, I mean, a lot of people don't like the way we farm because we've got 5,000 hogs and I don't know how many square feet, but, you know, they're not running around and playing in the sunshine. and um, you They know, don't wear the, little clothes? No. Um, I have painted glasses on them with uh, their their little chalk that we have in the barn sometimes, but that's about as far as they get with clothing. Um, but I... There are, I know a lot of people, um, they want their sows to be, I, I can't remember, crate free, I guess. Uh-huh. So the sows, um, a lot of them, they're in kind of a crate that's, that confines them. But the reason for that is so that the babies don't get squished and stepped on. Um, a, a mama pig, um, I'm sure she probably loves her babies, but she also thinks nothing about just laying on them and suffocating them to death. Um, so that's how we don't have sales, but I know that's a lot of, how a lot of other growers do it. And, and, um, I do know if you, um, do the crate free, so they will pay you a premium when you take them, um, to the market mm-hmm. for those, you get paid a little more because they can put the label, you know, um, that these sales were able to, you know, walk around freely. They weren't confined, um, and that's fine if you if you can afford it. And that's that's more of a values based mm-hmm. thing that I like to say. You know, if you if you believe in that and you can afford it, um, for us, like the way that we're raising hogs, that's the only way that meat can be affordable for a lot of people in the U.S. and in the world. Right. right. Um, which 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 I cannot you know reiterate enough how much there is a food shortage and and what we've got a plan for for 2050 all you have to do is google food shortage 2050 and a lot of people are raising alarms that we all need to be listening to now to prevent something horrible from happening and just i mean theoretically i could still be alive in 2050 and i'm going to be hungry if i've lived that long yeah um what are some other uh technology oriented kind of things that you all are doing and that you're aware of i know you had mentioned to me um earlier about tractors that drive themselves and you know what are some and and also of course i'm fascinated by um you know all the different ways that that uh computers are being used where you could check on your farm from here in this office and things like that tell me a little bit about that okay so i can talk about this for a long time so you'll just have to stop me i won't keep going (laughs) um so i'm i'm just gonna start here and i don't know what kind of train we'll end up on but um one thing is you know the soil health i mentioned that um we want to make sure that we're putting enough fertilizer so that we're not robbing the land of the nutrients that it needs for future generations. Um, but we also don't want to over-fertilize. Um, nitrogen runoff is an issue um, into our lakes and rivers. Um, whenever those plants get the nitrogen, you know, it's meant to make our corn and soybeans and rice grow faster and better. But whenever the, the lake plants get it, you know, they grow. And then when they die, they rot and it causes issues. So, um the variable rate is one thing. Um, we're trying to put just as much nitrogen as we need, and people are doing split applications of nitrogen. So rather than putting 
enough nitrogen for the whole farm to begin with, um, they they come back mid season and put a second application. So they're putting less, but they're putting it twice. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that we do um, just in the equipment world. So um, we're having they've added to our tractors, combines, and everything. It's called the DEF tank, D E F, which is basically nitrogen. Um, but somehow I'm not a scientist or an engineer, but it basically um, goes through our engine somehow and, and decreases the emissions that we're putting out or the bad emissions, pollution. Um, and anyone who pays attention to tractors, you'll notice that older tractors have like a small exhaust system and now they're huge. You know, they're half the size or, you know, like a, a four seater kitchen table. They're about half that size maybe. Um, and that's just filtration and cleaning systems to clean our emissions. Um, and yeah, tractors driving themselves. We've got GPS and computers. Um, we've got it now. John Deere, I mean, you can set your straight rows and go, but it'll also turn on the ends for you. Um, you can set flags in the field. So if there's a telephone pole or something, you can you know, know that it's coming and avoid that. Or cemetery. I've noticed a lot of fields have cemeteries in the middle of them from from the old days. Yeah. So it can go around those and not destroy them. Right, right. And, and I mean, the whole point of that is it's more efficient. uh, Whenever a farmer's just trying to drive it, they may, you know, overlap onto their last row. So then they're basically double seating that row. Um, But it's also just just driver fatigue so they're not as tired at the end of the day they can maybe go longer or just you know be better rested um so water efficiency is another um it's not as huge of a deal over here um like in the tennessee west kentucky area we don't have as much irrigation but i mean i'm sure you've noticed as you drive past there's several center pivots going up um, but over across the river in Missouri and Arkansas, and as you get to the west more, um, Kansas, there's there's all kinds of irrigation, not just a center pivot. They have what they call a row irrigation, so poly pipe that's you'll see a white pipe at one end of the field, and it's shooting water down to the end. Um, there's something called Netafim, which is um, – you you would probably never even know it's there because it's underground. It's it's a lot more expensive. Clint and I are looking at, at maybe putting that in some places where we can't put a center pivot up due to we've got 16 telephone poles in the field and, you know, we can't afford to have those moved. Um, but just using water efficiency, efficiently, um, less – when you're using less, you know, there's more for everybody else. And, and honestly, uh, sometimes we make more – a lot of our uh, yield, whenever I'm looking at yield maps, uh, the the lower yield areas are where that was overwatered. So too much water is just as much of a problem as not enough. So what, um, all, all these things, all these technological advances, all these, uh, chemo- you know, the GMOs and all the things they're doing, you know, in the lab, you know, this takes, this takes, years of study and learning and I mean you've really obviously spent a lot of time you know on this in your in your um, class at, at, at UT Martin I'm sure in your agriculture classes there were other uh, people there that were doing the same thing mm-hmm. you're doing um, do you see anything similar in young farmers today do you all have a common trait um, if somebody is currently in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade and trying to decide what to do, you know, are there uh, are there similar passions that that people like you have today that parents should get young yeah. folks interested in? Yeah. Um, so I'm actually involved in Young Farmers and Ranchers, which is a Farm Bureau organization. Um, Farm Bureau is actually who keeps me probably the best informed about about all these topics we've covered today. Um, but we do, it's called Farm Day. Um, I know O'Brien County does it, Weekly County does it, and I know lots of other counties across the state do it. Every fourth grader in the county comes to the fairgrounds here in Union City, and uh, we will have Tyson Foods there. Um, I think Tosh has sent maybe a couple pigs before. We've had a traveling dairy exhibit come we have beekeepers. Um, we'll have several crops there, you know, cotton, corn, soybeans. Um, and then, I mean, we'll have some inter- entertainment. Um, and we basically just take the kids around from station to station. Um, I know one year I did a, I led the sheep, the sheep um, exhibit. And I mean, it was so funny because kids had 
never seen sheep before and they kept saying that the sheep grew cotton on their backs and I was like no that's wool you know cotton is a plant so um it was crazy to me they didn't realize that cotton and wool were not one in the same and right. one's animal one's plant um, right. a lot of and, and we're just trying to educate them I guess but also I mean inspire them um we've done a career day for I think it was sophomores and juniors in high school um to, to just see all the different careers that can be agriculture without actually being on the farm. Um, so you can be an ag loan person, you know, officer um, working at a bank. You can work for a John Deere dealership like I am. You could work for um, Pioneer or Monsanto or Bayer and just be a scientist that's, that's making these genetic modifications or trying to create safer chemicals or better chemicals. Um, and it's, um, just kind of eye opening because even even me as a farmer's daughter um, that you know went to school, I didn't know what all the different jobs were that you could have that would be ag related. Um, and it literally, I mean, it starts at the guy who plants the seed in the field, but it ends, um, you know, with the trucker leaving Kellogg's, you know, taking it to Walmart or wherever they're delivering their food. So, well, see, as as you know, at Discovery Park of America, our mission is to inspire children and adults to see beyond and learn things they didn't know. So, that's one of the things we're passionate about here is exposing young people to ideas like perhaps I could go into agriculture um, because it, you're right, it is it is an area that people in many ways have kind of forgotten about. And so, pe- someone might want to be um, a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant. Content, but being in agriculture is a very viable option for yeah. for folks. Well, even being a lawyer, um, one of my friends in in Young Farmers and Ranchers is a lawyer, um, but she could base her practice totally to represent farmers to help farmers. Because um, I mean, we do get into you know I hate to say it, we get into lawsuits. People, nobody wants a hog farmer living down the road from them. You know, um, nobody likes chicken barns down the road. Um, you'll have someone get upset and say that, you know, you sprayed your field and killed their roses or, and I mean, sometimes there's probably, you know, there may need to be repercussion for that. Um, but a lot of times it's just an uneducated public. Right. Right. And that, and that, you know, you you are, um, an incredible advocate for agriculture. And I know a lot of farmers out there who don't have the way with words and the, you know, the way with posting on Facebook that you have. So I know that they all appreciate that just like we appreciate you being here today. Um, and sharing for having me. Yeah. You know what? It's, uh, you ha- you have a standing welcome to come to Discovery Park <laughs> of America any time with your kids. I'm assuming your kids have been here. We are and all love members. <laughs> okay, good, good. Even better, even better. So I know that just like me, our Real Foot Forward listeners discovered at least one thing, probably a hundred things that they didn't already know. Um, so thank you so much. Um, coming up, we have Andrew Gibson, who's going to once again take us behind the scenes of Discovery Park of America, after which we will no doubt discover something else new so thanks a lot thank you scott i am andrew gibson with the education department here at beautiful discovery park of america and today i am with mr hugh wade docent extraordinaire who has got roots embedded into the foundations of discovery park of america and today he's going to be telling us more about one of our exhibits which is the world war ii jeep so mr hugh thank you so much for being on the podcast with us thank you for inviting me so just tell us more about the about the Jeep and for all the listeners and myself. Have you got all day? <laughs> I do, yeah, yeah, as long as you'd like. Well, uh, at the first meeting that I went to with the architects that were going to design and build uh, Discovery Park of America, I was asked what would I envision in the military as far as large items. My answer to him was a jeep, a tank, a helicopter, and an airplane. We do have all of those now on display here at Discovery Park. Uh, The jeep I actually found on eBay many, many years ago, and the jeep did not sell. And at that time, you could find out who was selling. So I found out this lady in California and I called her and I asked her why the Jeep did not sell, and she said it did not meet my buying price, uh, reserve price, 
And I asked her what it was. She quoted me a price. I said, would you sell the Jeep now? And she said, yes, I would. She also went on to tell me that the Jeep was 85% restored, and she had some extra pieces to go with it. So she sent me a list of these extra pieces and several, several more pictures. And I got with uh, Kirkland and Rippy, and I said, uh, here's a good buy on this Jeep. And they said, well, see if you can buy it and get it here. Well, I called her back and negotiated with her and finally got her to the price we wanted to pay. And she was going to find a, a carrier out there to bring it from California to Union City. And uh, I didn't know when the carrier was going to come to Union City. However, uh, I, they had my cell phone number, and uh, one day I was going uptown, driving down Real Foot Avenue, and I knew the carrier was going to deliver it not to Walmart parking lot, but E.W. James Grocery parking lot. Lo and behold, here this carrier is, and I see a Jeep on it, thinking it's got to be ours. So I pull in the parking lot and, and get out and walk up to the driver, and he said, I'm looking for Hugh Wade, and I raised my hand. And we unloaded the Jeep, and I drove it over to my home on Ethery's Lane, put it on the carport. And at that point in time, I knew that I had to buy the extra parts that we needed it to bring it up to 100%, which included different things. Uh, the biggest thing was the decals that went on the Jeep. And when we're talking about the decals, it became evident that we wanted to identify the Jeep with the World War II National Guard unit that left here going overseas. And that was Company K of the 117th Infantry Division. So, uh, you know, I got the information and got all the decals to put on the Jeep as such. And also became aware that Robert Kirkland wanted the Jeep identified serial number-wise as George Patton's birthday. George Patton's birthday is November the 11th, 1885. Well, found out that all quarter-ton vehicles, which are the Jeeps, start off with serial number 20. Every one of them. So our serial number is 2011, which is November, 11, which is the 11th, 85, and you got to assume it's 1885 for his birthday. So that's how our serial number is marked on that Jeep. Now, I do have a conflict with the scope part. I have two of those wide, narrow pictures of company cake that left here, and they do not want to put them out. However, Mr. Kirkland at the same time wanted me to verify that Company K actually had a Jeep. Uh, Mr. Bill Tanner, which was a colonel in Company K at the time, was still living. I called him, and he says, no, I did not have a Jeep, but my company commander, which was Tom Elam, again, a lawyer from Union City, both dead now, had a uh, Jeep. So you are okay to market as such. So, Mr. Hugh, do you know uh, when the Jeep was made or even possibly where it came from? Actually, our Jeep was made in 1942, uh, April of 1942, and we really suspicion it probably was made in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, most of the Jeeps were actually made close to uh, seashore ports. However, some of them weren't. And one of the companies that I dealt with that keeps up with serial numbers and so forth could not actually tell me that it was made, but he's suspicion that it was from the number of the serial number on the Jeep. So, Mr. Hugh, uh, you're a docent here at Discovery Park of America, and most times we can find you uh, in the military gallery. What's your what's your history with uh, the, the, your fascination with the military gallery? Well, I've just always had a fascination with the military. As a youngster, all my uncles on both sides of my family brought me stuff from World War II and Korea, and I played with this stuff as Boy Scouts, Coast Scouts, camping and everything. So that was my fascination. I became interested 
in the military surplus business because this was a business that Walmart wasn't in and you can't compete with Walmart. <laughs> so I was in that surplus business for 30 odd years and that was the reason why I was asked at Old Old Bank County to do the uh, bottom floor of that museum as military about two years prior to it being closed. So, Mr. Hugh, out of all the weekends, um, all the times you've spent here at Discovery Park of America, what artifact do you think most patrons interact with in our military gallery? The helicopter. <laughs> Everybody wants in and out of the helicopter. Uh, little kids, big kids, large kids, old people, large people, just any and everybody wants to get in and out. Actually, the first weekend that we were open, if I could have charged one dollar for every picture that was taken, we'd have, I would have paid for that helicopter, my plane trip up there, and the cost to get it back down here to Union City. So, Mr. Hugh, you you mentioned you could have paid for that trip to go up and get the helicopter and your your you know the transportation back here. Where is up there? Where is the helicopter from? The helicopter I found in Port Jervis, New Jersey. A guy up there flew with some three or four different big items in the military. And he had redone the helicopter and marked it with the serial number and the markings of the the helicopter that actually picked up Alan Shepard when they dropped him into the Atlantic off of Mercury 3. Now, I'm not telling you that this shopper is exactly that one. We're 50-something serial numbers apart from the one that actually did pick up Alan Shepard. But some of the history going back on the chopper that enticed us to buy, that particular brand and model of chopper, Sikorsky, was the first chopper that any of our presidents ever flew the country in, with Eisenhower being the first, which takes it back into the early 50s. I got a couple other things I really <laughs> need to tell you about the chopper. Okay. First thing, it's a Ford. And uh, the, the the Ford or the uh, the I'm sorry the Jeep or the helicopter. I'm talking about the uh, Jeep. Now. The Jeep. Let's go back to the Jeep. Okay. All right. Our Ford, our Jeep is a Ford. Willis was the major contractor and the designer of the Jeeps, so they made about seven hundred fifty thousand, and Ford only made about two hundred fifty thousand of them. Okay. The deal was Ford was called GPW. GPWs were synonymous, the name, name Jeep came from. Uh, so at the end of World War II, Willis wanted to keep the name Jeep. But since they were the major contractor and supplier and designer of it, they went to federal court, and the federal court actually gave Willis the rights to use the name uh, Jeep, whence they are still using today. However, that makes our Ford, because it was only made from like 41 to 45, uh, more of a collector's item for us. Now, every part on that Ford has got a little fancy F. I'm talking about nuts and bolts and everything else. So you might, in years later, buy Willis from the military that had four parts on it. Because all parts were interchangeable from both the Ford and the Willis. Well, all right. Well, thank you, Mr. Hugh. I know I've learned a lot today. I sure hope our listeners have learned something new today. Uh, before we go, you can find Mr. Hugh and our other docents down located in our military gallery, encouraging patrons to get in the Jeep Willie, encouraging patrons to get on our helicopter for that nice photo op. Uh, thank you for listening to the Real Foot Forward at West Tennessee podcast, and we hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.